I'll be talking about uh, this, predominantly about this, this critter cam concept. Can you hear? Okay, there we go. Um, and uh, it, it was reminded when I thought about the title for this talk of the, you know, the, the commercial we've all seen of the guy walking around saying, you know, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? And uh, um, I'd love to be able to do that with animals. We, ultimately, the ultimate dream is that we can do that. We can see from the animal's perspective what they're doing out there in the wild at any moment in time through a, a, a National Geographic channel we're going to call National Geographic Live. Uh, where if you want to see lions, you can pick them out on the screen and see lions right now live, or giraffes or zebras, or whatever you may want to do. But what's the reality of this? The reality is, no, no, we can't do this now. And, and in fact, we're just sort of making our way in this direction. Um, it's taken some time, and I've been working on this for about 20 years, this whole concept for about 20 years. We've still got a long way to go. So. These are the guys that I started, really captivated my interest in the beginning. Marine species that we can't observe, we can't stand back and watch them from afar and expect to understand their behavior. We have to find new interesting technologies to, in order, that enable us to ride along with these guys to see the world from their perspective. So our ultimate objective, real time, live, intimate, unproduced, and I think that's, that's a world we're getting into now where we're realizing that what we're, what we're fed on television is very produced, very static images uh, or stories of what's happening in the natural world. And I think that we're, we're gathering a, a taste for seeing the real thing. Engaging experience with the natural world that inspire people to care about the planet. And I think that that's, that's one of Geographic's missions, to inspire people to care about the planet. And it's, it's where we're going with this whole concept. Well, this is the experience that inspired my original uh, venture into this whole field. Back in 1986, I was diving and, and saw a shark swim up to me. It had a couple of these guys suckled onto its belly. And, and in that moment, I realized, wow, what an amazing experience of the shark's life remoras have. We need to design an electronic remora, ride along with the sharks, and study their behavior from that perspective. Well, this was that first beautiful, spectacularly wonderful uh, system that I designed back in 1987, put on this animal back in 1987. Monstrosity, terrible thing. But the amazing thing was that this animal, in a captive environment there in Belize, didn't do anything unusual. It just behaved, as far as I could tell, normally, and gave us the hope that we might actually be able to do uh, real science, real research with this, this concept. Thank God, you know, for the first four, three, four years, I, I designed most of these systems with help, from, uh, with help from friends of mine. But right in, right in here, I started getting funding from National Geographic, and Geographic has got great sort of engineering resources. And in here, I was actually able, able to put together an engineering team. Um, and uh, ever since then, uh, my engineering team was really responsible for designing and building these systems. One of the guys, in fact, Corey Jaskolsky, did his degree here at, uh, at MIT. Um, Anyway, the systems now are two and a quarter inches in diameter, about you know, nine or 10 inches long. This system will record eight hours of video, uh, completely microprocessor controlled, with a lot of other functionality built into it. Obviously, we need to keep the water out for marine applications. Uh, battery is the big issue. And if anybody has any solutions to, you know, to battery storage, please let me know, because that's where we're, we're failing at this point. Uh, and then, of course, we've got to recover these systems, because they, they record on board, again, the, remember that first slide, no, we're not yet in the position to be able to see this in real time. We're get, we will get there someday. Um, but for the time being, we have to record on board for these marine systems. So we've got to recover the systems. They detach from the animals by virtue of the you know, microprocessor controller and the programming. They float to the surface. They emit a signal. We, we triangulate on that and go out and pick them up. We're recording all kinds of data now. Back in the beginning, it was just the, the novel component of this was, of course, the, the vision, the video. But we're obviously also recording audio, temperature, light levels. And now we've got pressure, um, uh, velocity, accelerometry, three, you know, full three-dimensional accelerometry built into these systems. So we're able to resolve the full context in which these animals are expressing their natural behavior. And this is a, this is a, a graphic of uh, an actual emperor penguin dive time death recorder. It turns out that, that we, when we started this work, we thought all the interesting, things, interesting behavior was happening in these deep dives down here at the bottom of this graph. But in fact, all the interesting uh, foraging behavior happens right up here underneath the surface of the ice. And we would never have known that if we weren't able to ride along and see what the animal's doing from its perspective. If you're there in their environment, you're having an effect on their behavior. That's, we want to extract the human observer and do it vicariously with technology. 
How do you get these things on? Well, you, you work carefully uh, because ultimately what we're doing here is research. And if we're not doing research, we shouldn't be doing this. And that's part of the ethical issue that, that we should be talking about, will be talking about inevitably as we, as we deal with human environment interactions. Uh, we need to make sure that first and foremost, we're taking care of these animals and letting them do what they do naturally. Uh, so we work hard to try to minimize the impact we have. Do we have an impact? Yes, we do. We try to, we try to minimize that though. And I'll show you a bit more how. Uh, epoxy patches for seals and sea lions, a uh, little backpack harness for emperor penguins, and I'll show you right now uh, how we work with sharks. But the key thing is, let's see, let's stop guessing what these animals are doing. Let's stop guessing what's important in their life histories. Let's see it, in fact. Give them the tools to show us directly what's important to them. Sharks are the least interesting animal on the, in the, on the planet. Uh, so I'm going to show, <laughs> actually they're fascinating, but from a, from a behavioral perspective, this is what they do. They swim. So I'm not going to show you any images, except maybe perhaps at the end, of what sharks do out there. Uh, great animals, by the way. But I wanted to show you a little bit about how we go about pursuing this objective of minimizing our impact so that we can assure ourselves to the best degree that we can at this point in time, given the size constraints of these systems. Um, how, these, how we go about deploying this system to, to try to minimize our impact. In the beginning, when we first started working with tiger sharks, we used to catch them. Standard way, throw out a hook, put a bait on it. The animals would, would catch, would uh, chew on that bait. We'd pull them over to the boat, we'd flip them over uh, into tonic immobility, and from there we would deploy the critter count systems. Well, I didn't think that this was a terrifically wonderful idea, so I was talking about this with a friend of mine in South Africa one day, and he said, you know, listen, I spent a lot of time in the water with sharks, he and I were diving with tiger sharks there at Alley Wall Shoals, and he said, you know, these guys are not aggressive. They're pretty, pretty easy to approach. How about if you just give me a critter camp system and I'll swim down there and I'll, I'll deploy it really gently. And I said, well, you, you gotta be crazy. And you gotta be a little bit crazy to be in this business at all. I'm, I'm sure, you know, you guys, you guys understand that. Um, <laughs> the, um, but we did that, we tried. And again, remember, the objective is we're not, we're trying to minimize our impact on these guys so that we can be fairly confident that they are, once we get ourselves out of the water, once we get the bait out of the water, that they go back to doing what they naturally do. And here's, I show this just because next time you're in the water with a tiger, you know, 12 or 14 foot tiger shark, just, you know, if it comes over to you, just put your hand on it and you can push it away. It's no problem. They're beautiful animals. We don't want to poke holes in them. We don't want to hurt them. We don't want to get them by the hook. But let's, how about if we do this? We can swim down with a passive dorsal fin clamp, that we call it, swim down to the back of these guys and um, very gently, very benignly put this thing on their dorsal fin, which is the consistency of your earlobe uh, cartilage. And we can be fairly confident now that these guys are going to be coming back and exhibiting natural behavior. And we can therefore do good science. Um, as soon as these guys get out of the water, of course, and they go back to doing what it is that they do, when we can't be there to watch them. System is an older system. We've now got smaller systems that, uh, as I mentioned, that are two and a quarter inches in diameter. You can't do that, or at least I haven't yet tried to do that with a great white shark. So I, shot, I thought I'd show you this. You know, this is how we do it with white sharks. We have a long pole, we can extend over the side of the boat. The white shark swims up to the boat and we can pull the trigger on the pole. It automatically clamps that clamp down onto the dorsal fin and the sharks uh, swim away to do what they do. And there's not time really, well, let me show you this first one. I'm, there's not time to show you the whole thing here, but he's now chasing a seal. And that's about as natural as you get. And it kind of contrasts with this concept that, that really is part of that discussion of the ethical issues that we're dealing with here. You know, people are now, this is a picture from a friend of mine who just spent a couple of weeks in Guadalupe Island working with white sharks there. And part of his film team, this is what they do as part of, part of the film process. And it's, it's to me, this is, a, this is an issue we need to be dealing with. How, you know, how much do we interact with animals in order to provide a, a, you know, a filmic experience, an exciting film experience? My perspective is, we need to do this less and we need to do more research and make sure that we're doing uh, these things appropriately. We test with animals as much as we can in captivity and it's only after we've done that that we go out into the field to do work with these guys. We test on ourselves as much as we can. You know, that, that, yeah, that left a little bit of a hickey but uh, it turns out it was perfectly fine. 
We asked him to go, just like those leatherback turtle, we asked him to go down to 1,000 meters to you know, test to see if it worked down there, but I don't know why, but he refused. <laughs> We've done a lot of work with seals and sea lions, um, and in fact, to harp with, with monk seals, We've, we've actually had a huge impact on the conservation of these, these guys because before we did these deployments, we thought we knew what the, what the critical habitat for, for critical foraging habitat was, and we got it all wrong, completely wrong. The area that we'd set aside as protected habitat was not their critical foraging habitat. It wasn't until we saw where they were feeding, <laughs> excuse me, where they were feeding that we knew, finally knew, and that, that protected habitat is now being increased to include uh, the critical foraging habitat, which of course they need to survive. This is generally how we see whales, you know, they disappear below the surface and um, uh, yeah. in order to study them, you know, the, for some animals we can kayak up to them, we can lean over the side of the kayak and put a critter cam system on with a suction cup again. Uh, for other guys like these humpback whales up in Alaska, you really need to kind of extend the pole over the side of the boat and suction cup it on that way. And I'm going to show a, a quick video here of uh, some work that we just did. It's, I guess it's a few months old now, with humpback whales looking at the bubble net feeding event. We'd seen it from individual whales' perspectives for the last 20 years, but we finally saw it from the perspective of an onlooker. This is, as you'll see here in a second, this is, and this is the first time we've seen this, this is a calf nursing on, on her mom. And, um, and then ultimately what happens is the mom has to, has to go feed herself and fend for herself. So she needs to release, and you'll see her tap the calf on the head here in a second. And then she goes down to engage in this really synchronized collaborative event called bubble net feeding that happens up in Southeast Alaska. Um, and um, it's a very complex event in which a, bunch, a whole community of animals get together and they socially forage by, cor by, by, by sort of evicting the, the herring that are that they are the prey from the bottom of the of the ocean there, push them toward the surface in a ring of bubbles that you can't quite see in this image, and then they all race up into this bubble net, flashing their pectoral fins to scare the fish toward not only toward the surface but then into their mouths as they race toward the surface and burst, burst throw open their mouths and, and swallow as many herring as they possibly can. A lot of the herring escape. Didn't realize that. That helps to explain why they do it over and over and over again for months at a time during the summer. Done quite a bit of work with emperor penguins. Um, there's no time to show you images, but again, we, 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 they're under six feet of ice and you just can't see what's going on down there. So you need these remote imaging tools to go and uh, witness. This is a project with uh, Bill Gilley from Stanford. This last week, I just, these are brand new images. I just had to show you something that was brand new. Um, you know, how do you, how do you work with a Humboldt squid? I actually didn't think this would work. And in fact, I'll show you that we, we discovered it doesn't really work in one context. We had to move to a second context in order to make it work. That's just a little, little sort of, uh, I don't know, like a harness that we put on these guys. And then, um, and then you're riding on, on the mantle of a Humboldt squid. Not exactly a giant squid, but a Humboldt squid off the coast of, and here's a filmmaker. <laughs> this is one of the issues that we need to deal with, you know, for science, often science at National Geographic, science and image making, filmmaking are, are married, and we, we just need to make sure that there's a, there's a pretty distinct line between, um, between the two so that we do this, we set up and do this appropriately uh, with the right priorities in mind. Now we discovered the, on the first deployment, we had lights, we included lights that were projecting out into the water column on the squid. And we discovered pretty quickly that those lights excited the other squid and it's in, in, their, in the environment uh, considerably. Uh, and the other squid would come in and basically try to, um, well, basically attack the, the squid that had the, had the criticum system on it. And we quickly discovered that that was really not appropriate. You know, if we're, if we're inciting that kind of reaction, it's, uh, this, this concept can't work. So on the subsequent two deployments that we did, now, the criticum system here has been knocked off. It's now floating back to the surface, and the squid are just coming back and, and, uh, and attacking it independently. <clears throat> Don't show this to your kids. <laughs> we subsequently worked with uh, uh, squid during the day instead of at night, so we didn't need to have the lights on. And now this is, this is much more natural behavior, and, and of course, this is where we'll, we'll continue this kind of work. Um, we're seeing you know, natural, uh, social behavior between these animals, the flashing, the communicating. This has not yet been analyzed. Again, this, this work literally is hot off the press. We were just there uh, a week ago. And uh, while there's some added interest in the Criticam system 
I think those are spermatophores. Um, by other animals, it's, there's, there's not an excessive amount, and this animal was never attacked. So that flashing is bioluminescence, not bioluminescence, but, but it's sort of natural uh, coloration. Anyway, there's probably not time to see any more of that. But from, a, from a, the, the nearest hope to coming up with a concept of, you know, can you see me now, is of course with terrestrial animals, where it's much easier to transmit uh, the experience. And someday we are gonna see whether bears have these kinds of parties in the woods. But in the meantime, we're kind of constrained to working with, with our own pets and animals that are a bit more cooperative. So this is Snake, my cat. She was the first one, first volunteer to wear a terrestrial in, incarnation of this critter cam system. Uh, much smaller you know, systems where it's really battery constrained at this point because the cameras are all very small as you guys know and the transmitters are small. It's just how, the, how large a battery can any given animal wear as appropriate. And of course you're, the compromise is that ultimately uh, there's only so, much, only so much transmission time that you can expect out of, a, out of a system. I don't know what's going on here. Yeah, that was, that's too bad because I think you'd like to see that. Oh, well, it's actually kind of a horror show, so it's probably a good thing that you're not able to see that. <laughs> Later on sometime I could show you. But basically, let me describe what happens. Um, this cat, if you kiss your cats, please don't do it anymore. And you would see why in the images that, that uh, we would show you there. Because uh, it turns out that the cats go out. Yes, they do kill rats, and you know they're going to kill rats. But then did you know that they consume them head to tail, whole? It's just like horrifying. Anyway, the real work happens out here in the wild, and we've done work with, uh, with lions, zebras, a, a few other species, limited work, but we're able to remotely control these, these uh, imaging systems on the collar of, this, the, uh, of the lions from uh, this Yagi antenna. So we're communicating back and forth with the systems, checking in with it to see how uh, monitoring its uh, uh, functionality, and then also being able to download the data real time, up to three miles away. Working with smaller systems, of course, uh, pushing the frontiers, that one I've seen, shown you already. And uh, we've done some preliminary work with, uh, with uh, raptors as well. Now, you know, we've worked a bunch of different places around the world, but, but I really feel like this whole concept is just such, so, in its infancy, there's so much that, and we've discovered a lot of interesting things, but there's so many places that we haven't worked that's just, we're really just beginning to, you know, see what the possibilities are with this concept. Sorry. Should, you know, the great end of life is not knowledge, but act, action. You know, what do you do with all this stuff? And, you know, clearly one of the things that you do is you get out and you communicate with, with the, the research scientific audience. And so, you know, we get out there and we publish. But, you know, what else do we need to do with this? We need to connect with people. We need to get those people to care about it, to have those intimate experiences with these animals. And so we make films about the whole process as well. And, you know, in the process we've made, I don't know, in my group we've probably made something on the order of 50 films 50, 60, 70 films, and the question still, you know, is how kind of impact do you have? What kind of direct impact can you see? And so we, we try other ways as well. We've developed this concept of critter core. We're getting down. We're talking to kids. We're trying to get, develop this concept of citizen science where you get people, when they're young, engage them with these kinds of, this kinds of research where they're actually putting the critter camp systems on the animals themselves and hopefully getting inspired to follow up and do the tracking, do the data analysis, and really, really uh, have hands-on experiences of, of, uh, of the wild. Wildcam, uh, if you can log on to National Geographic Wildcam and see what animals are doing at, in, in Africa at this point, in a, on, off a reef in Belize, uh, a couple other places around the world. Uh, at some point, these two concepts, the critter cam concept and the wild cam concept, come together uh, to, to solve the, the problem of, that, of the title of this talk where, with a yes, uh, where you know, finally we're on a wild animal, and this isn't a wild animal, of course you'd recognize that, but you know, then transmitting back to home to the National Geographic Live channel. Because ultimately, if we're gonna make a difference in conservation, we've gotta get people to care. And the only way to do that is to have them understand. And uh, that's ultimately what we're, what we're trying to get. Get, see the world from the animal's perspective, experience the world in a very intimate way, care about these animals by virtue of that caring to, to conserve. Thanks.